Thank you very much. And uh, I'm happy to be here to be, talk to you about steamboat disasters on the uh, lower Missouri River. Unfortunately, my co-author and wife, Vicki, was unable to make it tonight because she has been ill with uh, pneumonia. So, <laughs> uh, but fortunately, well, or fortunately or not fortunately, I'm here to talk about it. Um, just, uh, we're frequently asked, well, what got you started on uh, writing about steamboat disasters? And what be it all began about 1990 or so, we were in Hannibal, Missouri, at the museum there, and they had a few artifacts that were being displayed that they said had been taken from a steamboat that had been recently excavated. And uh, they had some maps that showed all of these places in the Missouri River where all of these hundreds, actually, of steamboats had sunk. So well, that's kind of a cool thing. Maybe we want to do a book about that. So 30 years later, we decided to do it. That steamboat was the Arabian, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Well, imagine yourself, you're on the landing here in Jefferson City in the 1850s. The steamboat is coming up the river. You can hear it before you can see it. There's a rhythmic cannonade of exhaust. A chug, 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 chug. And you can see smoke rising from the tall chimneys. We would call them smokestacks. The rivermen called them chimneys on the boat. It came around the bend, and you can even hear, hopefully, you can hear, steam whistle. It's working? Well, anyway, you can hear it. <laughs> Believe me, you would not, you would be able to hear the piercing scream of a steam whistle. Uh, as it approaches the shore, you can uh, hear the boilers pant and expand like they're breathing in and out and you can see the open fires that feed them. And as it crosses over the current, the current hits the boat, and the boat itself can twist and bend. And the whole vessel is creaking and groaning with the sound of heavy machinery pounding away. And just a few inches above the water, on the main deck, it's littered with stacks of wood, merchandise, bags, bales, horses, cattle, mules, and many, many people. And as it gets closer to the landing, you can see the superstructure with more people who are on the deck above that, uh, who are in the cabins. And on the very top is a towering pilot house. It's easy to see why such a spindly looking boat could be derided as an orderly pile of Kenley, and why Charles Dickens, who after a ride up to St. Louis on the steamboat, said that the wonders, not that there were so many fatal accidents, but that any journey should be made at all. And yet, the Western River steamboat that plied the Missouri River from St. Louis up to Montana was, as he mentioned, a technological marvel that was superbly adapted to the needs of river transportation in the 19th century. Well, if that's so, why did 300 of these steamboats sink in the Missouri River? And the lower Missouri become known as a graveyard for such boats. Well, partly what made these steamboats successful, technologically successful, also made them susceptible to the disasters. But there were other reasons that began with the river itself. First, before I talk a little about the river, a few sayings about the river. We used to separate the men from the boys at the mouth of the river. The boys went up the Mississippi, and the men went up the Missouri. <laughs> Father Jacques Marquette, the first European to pass the Missouri River coming down the Mississippi, when he passed the mouth said, I've seen, hard uh, for me to read from here, I have seen nothing more frightful, a mass of, uh, you can see it. <laughs> Sorry, it's hard for me to read from this side. Anyway, it was very frightful, very much carrying all the, the debris and the trees and so forth from the mouth. This one I do remember, because it's Mark Twain, you have to have something from Mark Twain, you're gonna talk about steamboats and the river. The Missouri River is too thick, too thick to drink and too thin to plow. <clears throat> Well, the Missouri River today is nothing like what it was in the 19th century. Today, the river has been straightened, it's been cleaned, it's been cleared, it's modified by levees and dams. But in the 19th century, there were none of those things present. The upper river, north of Omaha, basically, was a rocky kind of a river, maybe even rapids. South of there, the lower Missouri River was a sandy river. Uh, 
If uh, Sandy Banks, Sandy Bed, had floods, came a spring rise and a June rise, and these floods could cut in new, cut new channels in the river. And when they did so, they frequently cut trees off of the banks and they fell into the river and swept all kinds of debris, in addition to sand and silt, down the river with them. A river could create a new island in a matter of days. Cora Island, which is a fish and wildlife refuge near uh, St. Charles, uh, was created in a matter of a couple of weeks when the Cora Number no. 2 a steamboat sank there and the sand and silt gathered around it so quickly uh, that it created an island which is still there today. But it could also take away. I'm not quite there ready for that. Uh, maybe you're familiar with the town of Weston. Weston's a nice little town in western Missouri. Used to be on the Missouri River and was an important river port. Uh, but then uh, in the mid-19th century, a flood came along, changed the channel, and Weston ended up two or three miles from, from the banks. Same thing happened to Brunswick, as a matter of fact. A farmer could have uh, his farm on the river, and then the flood would come along, and the next thing he knew, his farm was across the river, because the channel had cut through it. Well, before Weston was cut off from the uh, river, there occurred uh, several steamboat sinkings in that vicinity. The Oddfellow was sunk, sunk by a snag in 1850. The Admiral was sunk by a snag in 1858, near Weston. And near the mouth of Bee Creek, just south of Weston, the city of Portsmouth was sunk by a snag in 1861. The Blackhawk was sunk by a snag in 1862, and the Rialto was sunk by a snag in 1864. If you notice the theme there, you're correct. They were all sunk by snags. Trees have been swept into the river. Some of them giant trees like this one where they would, the root ball might be stuck on the bottom of the river and the tree, the tree trunk would be waving back and forth in the river in the current. And in the high water, you might not be able to see it if you're in a steamboat, and it could rip a hole in the bottom of the boat and sink it in a matter of minutes. Sometimes it just came floating down the river and maybe hit it, hit the boat and uh, did the same kind of damage. Now, when people think of steamboat disasters, they usually think of boiler explosions. And of course, those were the most spectacular disasters on the river and the most deadly. But as a matter of fact, most of the sinkings of steamboats, particularly on the Missouri River, came from snags. About two-thirds of those 300 boats that snag sunk were sunk by snags. The next most common cause of steamboat disasters in the Missouri River was fire. This happens to be a fire in the city of St. Louis in 1849. <laughs> Uh, which was the Great St. Louis Fire. It started with the white cloud up in the north end of the levee, spread down through 23 boats that burned up in a good portion of the city of St. Louis. Uh, it was a bad year for St. Louis because it was a cholera epidemic the same year. But fire uh, on these boats was always a hazard. I mean, they were wooden boats. They had, they had been painted. They, had, you know, they were dried out in the weather. Uh, they might have a barrel with some water in it, but it's firefighting equipment, but usually not much more than that, at least in the early days, it was fairly primitive. And if they caught fire, it could spread quickly and burn the boat up. Interestingly enough, the next third highest cause of uh, steamboat disasters is ice. We were talking about this uh, before, uh, before we started the program. I was talking to one of the folks here. And ice would come down the river. They're wooden boats. If they get trapped in the ice, they could be crushed. And it happened two or three times on the St. Louis levee. This one, I think, was in 1879. Uh, there were others. <clears throat> but in addition to all of these causes of disasters, and in our book we cover other causes, for example, crime and disease and what have you, uh, the steamboats themselves had the seeds of their own destruction. This is a painting of the Western Engineer, one of the first steamboats that came up the Missouri River. The first was the Independence that came up in 1819 up to Franklin, or New Franklin, well then Franklin. Franklin got <laughs> wiped out in the flood of 1826, and now it's New Franklin up on the banks. Uh, this steamboat uh, came up in uh, 1819 and uh, was uh, headed towards uh, Council Bluffs, or what was then Council Bluffs. Had an unusual uh, thing here on the bow uh, the steam and smoke was 
funneled through the bow to what was a, a serpent's head. And the intent was to frighten the, uh, the Native Americans. They probably were worried about these guys in the boat carrying guns, uh, but that was sort of the, the thought. There was also a military expedition that left around the same time, uh, three boats, uh, but they went so slowly that the soldiers on them finally got off the boats and just marched the rest of the way. <laughs> but the first boat, John Thomas Jefferson, sank near the mouth of the Osage River, and that was the first steamboat to sink on the Missouri River. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the design and building of steamboats. And this is where if Vicki was here, she would say, don't go micro, stay macro, don't get too much into the details. Well, I've got to get into a little bit of the details. Uh, this is another illustration, a sketch of the Western Engineer. And you can see, uh, parts you can't see, it, it had a, a deep uh, keel, like an ocean-going vessel. It was based upon what an ocean-going vessel would look like in 1819. Uh, its engine, steam engine, was a low-pressure steam engine that was below decks. All the cargo and the passengers were below decks. It even had a sail, which was totally useless on the Missouri River. And uh, the uh, pilot house and so forth was more towards the rear. And of course, here's the, uh, the unusual uh, smokestack with the serpent's head. Uh, this uh, was impractical for use in the Missouri River. The river had very shallow spots. If you had a deep keel, you couldn't get over it. You'd just ground in the sandbars or on the rocks if you went up further or not. So uh, within a space of a decade or less, uh, the classic version of the steamboat emerged in the design more or less by trial and error. This is the Vicky B, a model uh, of a late, late steamboat in the 19th century. Uh, I didn't build this model. I only own it. I bought it but named after my wife. But it's a, it's a, uh, it's a side wheeler. The side wheelers were the most popular kind, or most numerous kind of steamboats prior to the Civil War. Uh, primarily because they were pretty maneuverable. If you had paddle wheels on both sides, you could, in the heavy uh, meandering course of the river, you could run one paddle wheel forward, and one in reverse, and you could make the turns, it'd be easy to get into, uh, make the landings uh, on the banks and so forth. There was a disadvantage to them, uh, being located in the middle of the boat, took up a lot of space that could otherwise be used for cargo or passengers. It was difficult to get back and forth from the bow to the stern. And because the uh, paddles were on the side, all that debris that came down the river could get caught in those paddle wheels and uh, could uh, break them up. You'd have to stop and repair them and fix them. Around the time of the Civil War, and a little before, stern wheelers became more popular. Uh, they weren't as popular before the Civil War because they were not as easy to maneuver, but then with some technical, technological developments with their rudders, which I won't go into, but if you're interested, I can tell you about them later. Um, they, uh, they became just about as maneuverable, and they had several advantages. Cleared up more space on the main deck, uh, this, the paddle wheel was behind the boat, and so the debris that came down the river was basically would be blocked off by the rest of the boat and didn't get caught up in the paddle wheels as much, and they wouldn't be uh, busted up. Uh, this is the Bertrand, which I'll talk about a little bit later too. Bertrand was about 160 feet or so long, about 30 feet wide. The hull was only about five feet deep. The Bertrand was 250 tons or so, it could carry 400 tons of, of cargo and passengers and draw four feet of water. When you go on a river where the, the, the depth of the river could be four or five feet, or it could be 35 feet, you needed to be able to handle all of those conditions. And the ideal for the steamboat design was to have a boat that was long, have a boat that was wide, and a boat that was very, had a very shallow hull, basically flat. It was almost like a barge that was powered. And that way, you could spread it all out, you could put a lot of cargo on it, and you could, uh, you could get it up the river. Now, the engines that had to be used on these boats were high-pressure engines, not the low-pressure engines. They were at pretty close tolerances, and they didn't have enough power. 
to carry the uh, boat up the, against the current of the Missouri River. Now, those low pressure engines were popular in the east, in the Hudson River and the bays and things like that. But going up the Missouri River, the current could be pretty powerful. In the, in the spring, it could come coming down anywhere from 8 to 10, 12 miles an hour, and you have to push up against that. So you needed a high pressure engine. The high pressure engines didn't have such close tolerances. They were simple, rugged, easy to build, fairly cheap, easy to operate, and easy to fix. Because once you left St. Louis, headed towards Montana, there weren't any other shipyards. If something happened to your boat, you had to be able to fix it. And it supposedly it didn't take nearly as much training to run the engines. Uh, they were tricky to use. Uh, for one thing, uh, they took their water from the Missouri River, the Big Muddy. The water come into the boilers, the sand and silt in it. And in the early versions of the boats, they sometimes would have to clean out the boilers as often as every 15 hours. Somebody would have to climb into one of these things and clean all the junk out of it so they could uh, continue on. Uh, to try to get around that, they come up with some technological things. This, by the way, these are photos from the Arabia. They came up with some technological things. First, they had some mud drums, which would filter out sand and silt. Another problem they had was when they landed uh, and stopped the steam engines, then the pump that brought the water into the boilers would also stop. Well, you had to be very careful then when you started up again, because if you didn't do it correctly, you could end up having an explosion or something. So they came up with what they called a doctor to take care of it, which is just another pump that runs all the time and keeps water pumped into the, uh, into the uh, uh, boilers. They didn't have steam gauges. They kind of just winged it, the engineers, through, uh, what does it sound like? Is it getting the power right? Uh, you know, they didn't really know how much they had in terms of level of waters. So they had what they called tricocks. There was one at the top of the boiler, one at the middle, and one at the bottom. One at the top, if you had water coming out, you're probably, you're okay. One in the middle, if you had water coming out, you're probably okay. One at the bottom, if you didn't have water coming out there, you were really in trouble. You need to get some water in there quick. Uh, they had safety valves. This is one on the Arabia. But you can uh, imagine how effective they were when you learned that they were called death hooks in the industry. Well, despite all these issues, safety issues facing the steamboats and their operation, they were, as George Fitch said, who was one of the uh, writers about steamboats at the time, they said these steamboats were perfect for conditions on the Missouri River because they used a low grade of fuel, a low grade of water, and they only needed a low grade of management. But improper operation of these boats could lead to disasters. One of the first was the big hatchet in Herman, Missouri. On July 23, 1845, the big hatchet pushed off the landing at Herman, carrying primarily German immigrants, but other folks headed up river. After the uh, paddle wheels went around about three times, it exploded. The boiler exploded. Steam issued out. A number of people were scalded to death. 35 German immigrants were killed. Uh, because the boat was destroyed in the, in the accident, they lost all the records, so they don't even know the names of who the people were. But at Herman, Missouri, there's a monument that was erected uh, to these uh, uh, folks who died on the, on the big hatchet, the unknown dead. Uh, this is actually uh, the second monument. The first one deteriorated. They replaced it. You'll note that it says that it occurred in 1842. Uh, I don't know why, because it didn't. It occurred in 1845. Uh, in those days, there was a federal law that said that the captain could be tried for a criminal negligence if he hired an incompetent engineer. And so the captain of the big hatchet was put on trial uh, on the theory that the engineer that he had hired didn't know how to operate the boat properly and caused the accident. Uh, but the evidence showed that the engineer was actually one of the most competent and, and uh, well-known, best-known engineers on the river, and further, that the accident wasn't caused by anything the engineer did or didn't do, but there had been a crack in the boiler, and that's why the boiler exploded. The worst accident on the Missouri River 
occurred on uh, Good Friday, 1852. The Saluda was chartered by immigrants, Church of Latter-day Saint Mormons who had come from England, Scotland, and Wales, first through New Orleans and then up the Missouri River, Mississippi River to St. Louis, where they chartered the Saluda. The Saluda was a pretty old boat. It was six or seven years old at the time it was chartered, which was old for the Missouri River. The Missouri River, the average age of boats before they were destroyed or no longer useful was about three years, and the Mississippi was about six. The Saluda itself had already sunk once up near Roachport, had been underwater for a number of months, and then was recovered, uh, raised, and rehabilitated, and uh, uh, put back into service. That wasn't actually all that unusual uh, for steamboats at the time. Many of them uh, would sink and they would raise them. And, uh, you know, if they weren't completely destroyed, if they couldn't use the boat itself, they could use many of the items that were on the boat, the boilers or the engines, or uh, just, just the lumber could be used to be rebuilt. In fact, the Bertrand itself, that I was talking about earlier, was rebuilt from a boat that had sunk earlier in the uh, Tennessee River. Well, anyway, the folks uh, were coming upstream on the Saluda. The Lexington, Missouri, it's kind of hard to see here, but right here, it was the beginning of what was called the Lexington Bend. It's not really there anymore, but at the time it was a very sharp bend that went uh, just west of Lexington, around the river, there was a big bend, and the current would come around, the very strong current would come around there. Plus, they were there on uh, April of 1852, and uh, it was the, the spring rise, and there was some ice and so forth coming down the river. The Saluda made several attempts to go around the bend, but couldn't make it. And then, finally, on Good Friday, they made their last attempt. Uh, they pulled away from the landing, and again, much like the big hatchet, there was like three revolutions of the paddle wheels, and then all of a sudden, the boiler exploded. The boat was totally destroyed. Mm -hmm. Seventy-five people died in this accident. A number of others were injured. Uh, one of the persons who watched it all wrote about it later, and this is what he said after it exploded. The current caught the wrecked boat and threw it back against the levee, where it was tied up, the bow resting against the shore with the lower forward deck above the water and the stern several feet below the surface. As I ran down the hill, the first thing that I saw was a boat safe lying in the road, back of what's now the waterworks powerhouse. The safe was intact, and chained to it was a dead yellow spotted pointer dog, the boat's clerk's dog, <laughs> the mascot. This was about 70 yards from where the explosion occurred. In the flat, just west of the powerhouse, was the dead body of a large man, lying with his face down and his limbs extended, as if he had sailed through the air like a rock. Every thread of clothing had been blown off of his body. A sheet was soon spread over him, and he was identified as Captain Francis Belt, the commander of the boat. The citizens of Lexington rallied around the survivors of the Saluda explosion. Uh, they brought many of them into their homes. Uh, there were some children who were orphaned. Uh, a couple of these children were actually adopted by citizens of Lexington. Others went with other families and continued on on another boat, eventually up to Campsville, up to Council Bluffs, on into the wagon trains out into Utah. Uh, but they're still there. There's a memorial to the Saluda in Lexington. And uh, Lexington Historical Society has some uh, artifacts there including this door, which is made from uh, the remains of the Saluda. This door was in the house of a man named Casper Gruber, who uh, bought what was left of the Saluda and used it to build a house. He also adopted uh, one of the orphan children, uh, a young girl, and she grew up uh, in Gruber's home. Uh, the bell was sold for $17 to a minister in Savannah, Missouri. And it's still there at the First Christian Church in Savannah, Missouri, and a memorial also to the Saluda there with the, uh, with the bell. Well, you've heard about the steamboat race between the Robert E. Lee and the Natchez, I'm sure. If you've heard anything about steamboat races, you've heard of that. It's very famous, it occurred in the 1870s. Well, I'm going to tell you now about the longest steamboat race. This is the W.J. Lewis, and the W.J. Lewis raced with the Molly Dozier from St. Louis up to Montana in 1866. 
I don't have a photo of the Mali Dozier. We've been looking for it. We haven't found one that's really been authenticated yet. We think it looked something similar to what the W.J. Lewis looked like. Molly Dozier, by the way, is my wife's favorite boat. She really likes to talk about the Molly Dozier. Unfortunately, she's not here to do it, so I'm going to have to pinch hit on this, this part. Uh, in March of 1866, these two boats were going to be leaving for Fort Benton, Montana, and uh, they were going to uh, try to race up there to see who could get there first. The W.J. Lewis left with 260 tons of cargo, drawing about three and a half feet. Uh, its captain was Ed Herndon, its pilot was Carol Jones Atkins, uh, one of the well-known pilots on the Missouri River, who was paid $800 a month in 1866 to be the pilot, which is about $13,000 a month in today's dollars. And uh, he's racing against the Molly Dozier. His captain was Fred Dozier. The boat was named after Fred's wife, Molly. Uh, they didn't get away quite on time, and the Lewis got a lead. Uh, and the Lewis was ahead for about two weeks or two and a half weeks. So finally, on April 15th, uh, the Dozier caught up. And then further upriver, there was a cutoff. Uh, one of the bends, the river had cut through at the bottom of the bend, and you could go around, around the, the curvy part of the bend, or you could go straight across on the cutoff. Well, the Dozier went all the way around the bend, but the Lewis took the cutoff on the chance that it wouldn't get grounded in there, and actually they got ahead again. And uh, they kind of traded lead back and forth, uh, neck and neck, till they got up to uh, Vermilion, South, there, South Dakota. And again, it was a similar kind of a uh, uh, bend and cutoff. And this time, the Lewis went right, the Dozier went left, and left was the way to go. And the Dozier got ahead and opened up a lead of about two and a half miles. Later on, they encountered an ice field, because this was early in the, in the uh, season. It was in March, April. Uh, they ran onto the sandbar, and the uh, Dozier had to uh, grasshopper or walk across the sandbar. Now, uh, these boats had spars on the bows. And these spars, what they would do if they came to a sandbar, there were three ways to get across the sandbar. You could unload the boat cross the sandbar, reload the boat. Very time consuming. You could get animals or people or somebody to try to pull the boat across the sandbar. Probably not all that uh, feasible in many situations. Or you could grasshopper or walk the boat. And what you did is you had these two uh, spars. They would lower them down to about a 45 degree angle into the bed of the river, into the sandbar, and then with the capstan, they would pull it up to a 90 degree angle and then pull the boat forward and then they would take it up, put it down, pull the boat forward until they got over the sandbar. And they called that grasshoppering or walking the boat. Mark Twain writes about uh, taking a trip from uh, St. Louis to St. Joseph and the water, the river was kind of low and he said, well, we didn't really cruise, we kind of walked most of the way <laughs> using that particular technique. Uh, the boats managed to get close to each other again. They were close up. They actually crashed into each other at one point. Uh, but the Molly Dozier got delayed. The Lewis wound up winning the race when it arrived in Fort Benton on May 31st at 4.30 a.m. And it was about a day and a half or so ahead of the Dozier. But they both had a very profitable trip. The Lewis earned a $60,000 profit equal to about a million dollars today. The Dozier earned a profit of 50000 about 800 and some thousand dollars, and uh, ended up essentially paying for the boat and even more. Very profitable cruise for both of these boats. Now, the Dozier met a sad end in October of that same year, uh, opposite Chamois, Chamois, I don't know, I never can get that town straight. Chamois. Chamois. Okay, thank you. I always get it wrong, I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to write this down, Shemoy. Uh, at Shemoy, and uh, it, it sank. And uh, they tried to salvage it, but the salvage failed. And the place where it sank became known as the Molly Dozier Chute. Uh, and then, about 13 years later, the George Spangler was coming down the Molly Dozier Chute, and guess what? It struck the Molly Dozier's wreck and sank on top of it. The Lewis survived a bit longer, 
It sank near Grand Tower, Illinois on the Mississippi River, about 30 miles north of Cape in 1873. But it was salvaged, its equipment and everything was taken off of the, uh, the wrecked boat and put into a new boat of the same name in 1874. But it didn't have as happy a career. It burned in Chester, Illinois in 1875. This is the Montana. Uh, the Montana has been described as one uh, river historian as a behemoth. Uh, it was as long as a football field and nearly as wide. It carried over 100 passengers in luxury in these cabins. Uh, it could carry up to 600 tons of cargo and draw only about four feet of water. The Montana and its sister boat, the Dakota, were the two largest steamboats on the Missouri River in the 19th century. <coughs> now you'll notice that the Montana has seven letters in its name, and the Dakota, the way it's spelled, D-A-C-O-T-A-H, also has seven letters in its name. Well, the company that owned these two boats and several other boats that operated on the Missouri River uh, <coughs> was owned by a guy who was kind of superstitious. He thought all of his boats should have seven letters in their name. So every boat that he owned and his, that company owned and operated had seven letters in its name. One of them, for example, was the Far West, which was the boat that took the wounded off of the Custer Battlefield in 1876 down to Bismarck, uh, North Dakota. And the Far West, Far West, seven letters. Okay, there you are. All in the same company, one of the uh, large uh, shipping companies in the, uh, on the Missouri River. Well, on June 22nd, 1884, the Montana was on a run from St. Louis to Kansas City. Now, the Montana had been kind of an unlucky boat. It had run up to Bismarck, got caught in a tornado up there, ripped up, had to be repaired, came back down the Missouri River, and by the 1884, it was basically just running from St. Louis up to Kansas City or maybe Omaha or places like that. So on June 22, 1884, it was docked at St. Charles, Missouri. It was piloted that day by one of the legendary captains of the Missouri River, William Rodney Massey, one of my favorite guys to talk about. William Rodney Massey was born near Herman. He began working on the river in the 1840s. He claimed that he was involved in the rescue of survivors from the big hatching when it blew up. Uh, he was still serving as a captain on the river at the age of 78 when he came to blows with Captain Grant Marsh, who was 73, Grant Marsh had been one of the captains of the Far West, and they came, these two old guys up there, old as me, older than me, duking it out over some insult that Grant Marsh had made to William, uh, to Massey's uh, uh, company. But Massey was uh, known not only for his prowess as a riverboat captain, but also he was a gambler. And so, uh, in 1876, he was playing cards in Deadwood, South Dakota, and across the table from him was Wild Bill Hickok. Wild Bill drew, supposedly drew, aces and eights. Jack McCall sneaked up behind him because it was the one time Wild Bill didn't sit up against the wall and uh, shot him in the back of the head. The bullet went through Wild Bill's skull and lodged in Massey's left wrist. He never had it removed. And in fact, they say that when he traveled back up the river and he would arrive in the port in Montana, he would get off the boat and announce, the bullet that killed Wild Bill is back in town. <laughs> well, on June 22nd, 1884, which just goes to show you that even on, however good you are as a riverboat captain, you can still have a wreck. They pulled away from the landing in St. Charles, Missouri. The Montana was caught in an eddy, struck one of the... Uh, piers of the St. Charles Railroad Bridge. He did manage to get it over to the, uh, to the shore, but it was totally wrecked. It was not, it was, they could not refloat it. And so they brought in a salvage boat a couple of weeks later, the T.F. Eckert, which ended up salvaging over about 300 uh, steamboats and barges, all in the Western Missouri River, Western River system, the Ohio, the Mississippi, the Missouri. And within uh, a week or so, the uh, T.F. Eckert had removed everything of value from the uh, Montana. The furniture that was in the cabins, the steam engines, the boilers, 
the, uh, the uh, chimneys, uh, all the wood that would be taken would be used to be uh, either to be used for barges or for other purposes. The bells, the bell was actually sold to a company in St. Louis and was used in a, in a factory uh, for a number of years and leaving hardly anything behind. Just basically uh, the bottom part of the ship. That's all that was left. And uh, well, uh, a few weeks, a few months later, John Gonzalez, who was the captain of the uh, Dakota, the sister ship, hit a snag near Providence. And uh, it was actually a pretty prominent snag. People had known about it. Uh, it was known on the river. And uh, Massey said, well, how could Gonzalez have failed to see a stump as prominent as the one in the Providence Bend? And Gonzalez replied, well, <clears throat> it's not as prominent as the St. Charles Railroad Bridge. <laughs> Well, when the water is very, very low, and as it has been, I guess, in other places as well, but up in St. Charles, when the water is very, very low, you can see what remains of the Montana. It's basically just kind of what was left of the bottom of the hull. Uh, there really isn't anything there. The Marine Archaeological Outfit from Eastern Carolina University uh, came there in 2002 to do an archaeological dig. Uh, they didn't really find much in terms of artifacts. Uh, they did get a couple of books out of it, though. But, uh, you know, the academics, you know, great. And uh, it was very, some of them pretty interesting books. They're kind of technical, but they are kind of interesting. Uh, but it's there. And uh, if the water gets really low, you can see it. Now, I haven't personally seen it because I didn't think about going there in 2002 and looking at it. It was on TV. I saw that. Uh, and there's other places. Uh, one's been uncovered up in uh, South Dakota recently, and I think somebody told me, there was one somewhere around here, someplace that maybe been uncovered. I, I, I'm not familiar with the details of it, but anyway, uh, some of them are still under the river, and when the water's low, and there's some pieces of it left, uh, there they are. Well, uh, I mentioned the Arabia, and I am going to talk about it, but the Arabia wasn't the first steamboat to be excavated on the Missouri River and to have its contents put in a museum. The first steamboat to have that happen was the Bertrand. It was excavated in 1979 uh, under the auspices of the federal government. They, uh, it was near DeSoto, uh, Nebraska. Uh, they excavated it. Uh, they took all of the contents that they found there, put it in a museum up there. It's actually on the Iowa side now because the river changed course from where the boat was. Uh, the museum's on the Iowa side, the boat sunk on the Nebraska side. They ended up covering up what was left of the boat and just kept the contents. The Bertrand sank on April 1st, 1865. Uh, this is Horace Bixby. He was the captain of the Bertrand on the day that it sank. I ask this question whenever I give this talk. Some people have gotten it. Some people have it, so I'm going to ask it tonight. Feel free if you know the answer. Horace Bixby, anybody know who Horace Bixby is besides being the captain of the Bertrand? Something to do with the river. No? Okay. Horace Bixby was the man who taught Samuel Clemens, later Mark Twain, how to be a pilot on the Mississippi. If you read Life on the Mississippi, he talks extensively about Horace Bixby. And what happened to Horace Bixby and William Rodney Massey show that even the sk most skilled pilots uh, can have accidents on the, on the river and maybe there's not a whole lot they can do about it. Ah, now to the Arabian. Everybody asks, have you, do you know about the Arabian? Of course we do because it was the inspiration for actually doing the book. September of 1856, the Arabian was headed up river to uh, a town in Rulo, Nebraska, I believe it was, uh, with about 100 and so uh, passengers, 250 tons of cargo, when it struck a snag. This thing. According to the museum, this is the snag that they recovered from the, uh, from the Arabia. It went down quickly, and there were no casualties. All the people got off 
Many of them failed, able to save their baggage, which they left in the bank overnight, and when they came back the next morning, someone had stolen it. There was, however, one casualty on the boat, and that was a mule. And the owner of the mule said, I tried to get the mule off, but you know what mules are, they're stubborn, right? He's stubborn as a mule. He wouldn't get off the boat, so he went down to the boat and he sank. Well, when they excavated the Arabia, they found out that the mule had actually not, had been still attached. <laughs> its bridle had still been attached to the boat, and it was dragged down. And the uh, fellow who told that story wasn't being accurate. He lied about it. Maybe he didn't want people to know that he panicked and left his mule tied up in the boat. And you can see it there in the Arabia. Well, there were a number of efforts to find the Arabia before the uh, Hawley family, the ones that eventually excavated it, uh, managed to do it. Uh, one of the reasons was, here's the river, and the boat was over here, about 400 yards from the river. You had to find it first. And once you found it, you had to dig it out. Uh, this was actually their second attempt at excavation of a steamboat. The first one was the Missouri Packet, which was uh, closer to here. Uh, it was one of the earliest steamboats to sink in the Missouri River. Uh, but when they went in to get the Missouri Packet, they uh, got a little too anxious. They used heavy machinery to do the excavation, and they ended up busting it all up. And all that survived was a steam engine, which is still, they put it in the museum in Kansas City. But they learned their lesson about how to excavate steamboats from under the ground. Here's a photograph of the excavation. They had to do it in the winter because this was in a guy's cornfield. They cut a deal with the farmers that we'll excavate the boat and then we'll put it back the way it was. So they had to go in in the winter. Because of the water table, they had to have a lot of pumps to pump a lot of water out. The original budget was $250,000 to excavate this boat. They ran through that money pretty quickly. They ended up spending something like $3 million to get this boat out of the ground. Uh, it was hard work. It was dirty, it was cold, it was wet. But they said when they found the first cache of artifacts in the boat, it was like Christmas. This every day was like Christmas. Now the artifacts had to be stored, they had to be restored, rehabilitated, and preserved. They'd been under the ground for 150 years or so, but under the ground they were protected from all the elements. And that's why they were still there. But once you took them out from the ground, you had to put them someplace to keep them uh, from deteriorating. For example, on the Bertrand, when they took out uh, crates that had names of the uh, consignees and the shippers on the side, and maybe what the contents were, they took photographs of them when they took them out, but within a few hours, all of that writing had disappeared and was exposed to the air. Uh, they put some of these in a restaurant freezer that was owned by one of the team members. Others they rented a cave for in the Kansas City area and put them in there where it was cool and damp and dark. None of them had any experience or training in preserving or restoring the artifacts, and they had trouble getting anyone in the United States uh, to help them because what they had done, I guess, with the Missouri Packet. They finally got information and advice they needed from Canada and England. And today at the museum, they do have professionals who are restoring, continue to restore these artifacts, even now, what is it, more than 30 years later. Uh, I, in fact, we were up there uh, not too long ago, and uh, the, uh, the, the women there, woman there was restoring boots. And she said it would take her three days to restore one of the boots so it would be you know, available to be displayed. And uh, it's a very meticulous kind of a job. Uh, they weren't looking for gold. They did find 26 and a half cents in money, but that's all. <laughs> uh, one of the things that the early treasure hunters looked for on these boats was whiskey. Uh, apparently, if you found whiskey, uh, you were uh, able to escape the taxes on it or something, I don't know. Uh, there was a, a scam run on the Bertrand and people claimed that they had found the Bertrand and taken whiskey off the Bertrand and they were selling the Civil War whiskey uh, for, you know, five dollars a shot or something and it was exposed as a scam and, uh, you know, the fraud was, uh, was exploded by the local newspaper. Um, but what they did find, really, historically speaking at least, was much more important than that. All of these artifacts, uh, China, some of it fine China, 
regular dishes, uh, beads, I guess this is for trading with the Native Americans, uh, weapons, tools, uh, clothes, many of that's obviously was, many clothes were deteriorated, uh, doorknobs, keys. I mean, it, it was, if you go there, it's almost like walking into a 19th century Walmart. I mean, it just has everything you would need you know, for a, a settlement on the frontier or near frontier of Nebraska in 1856. If you go to the museum, and if you haven't been there, I urge you to go because it's well worth the trip. Uh, it tells the story of the steamboat and its sinking. It also tells the story of the people who were on the boat and about their everyday lives. It's in downtown Kansas City, at least for now. Uh, I understand that uh, they may be leaving in a few years and they're looking for a new site. I don't know if they've found one or it's been announced. I've heard various places proposed, and I guess uh, if they do move, they'll to some new place, they'll have to you know, build a building and everything. We'll find out soon where that will be. Uh, when we were there, and I'm told this happens frequently, Dave Hawley, who's one of the people who helped excavate the boat, was right there. He would greet you and talk to you about you know, all, any questions you might have about excavation of the boat. Uh, they are looking for other boats. One of them is the Malta, near Malta Bend, named Malta Bend because that's where the Malta sun sank. Uh, you can see here the outline of it. Uh, I don't know, are, are, you, are you familiar with the show, The, uh, the Curse of Oak Island? Okay, yeah, I know, people are laughing. It's a reality show, I, I know. Well, they have another show, it's a related series, the same guy, it's called Beyond Oak Island. And in season two, episode two, called Riverboat Riches, they talk to Dave Hawley. And it's actually really good. I mean, for a reality show, it's really good. They got some of the reality show vibe, but I mean, it's really good. <laughs> Holly tells about excavating the Arabian, and they go out to the site of the Malta, and he shows them how they discover these boats that are underground. And they have these, like, things, that, magnetometers or whatever, that these sophisticated devices that locate the metal. They find the boilers, or they find the steam engine. They know the dimensions of the boat. They know approximately where that that piece of uh, you know, the boiler, the engines were located on the boat, and so they're able to do an outline and they know how they're gonna actually uh, excavate it. And on, on the show, they do a drill down and they pull up some wood, and it's like, oh man, we found it, we found it. And they do another one where they try to find a boat that's located in, in still located in the Missouri River. And he has some kind of you know crazy scheme <laughs> where he's gonna go in and excavate it and then float it up in the river, I, I don't know, anyway. But uh, the show is actually pretty good. And uh, there are actually, there, there are also two experts that appear on the show, so-called experts. One of them is Professor Jerry Neely from Missouri State University. And the other is, <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, they say everybody's entitled to their 15 minutes of fame. I still got 14 minutes and 15 seconds to go. <laughs> But uh, I was on the show. Don't 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 get up to go get the popcorn and right, right at the beginning, or else you miss me. But I think you can see it online or go to history, uh, you know, the History Channel or whatever, and, and it'll be there. Uh, well, the golden era of the steamboat extended from uh, about the 1830s and 1840s to the end of the Civil War. They continued on. Uh, the last really uh, steamboats, commercial steamboats for passengers, lasted into early in the 20th century, and then basically it's been freight, and they turned over mainly to tow boats now rather than steamboats. They do just, there are still some excursion boats like Amer American Queen and Delta Queen that go in the Mississippi. Uh, but the Golden Age pretty much ended at the time of the Civil War. And why? One word. I'm sure you can guess what it is. Railroad. Railroads, exactly. The railroads began to replace the steamboats as the principal mode of transportation, not only in the Midwest and West, but in the East and South, everywhere. The railroads could build bridges across the rivers, which created hazards for the steamboats. Um, they were confined to the major rivers. They could go where they needed to go, where the traffic could be had. They could cross mountain ranges. 
they could operate during the winter uh, mostly. Maybe they could get snowed in from time to time, but steamboats could not go through the ice. Uh, they could carry as many passengers or maybe more as a steamboat could, as much or maybe more cargo, and probably faster, at least in many cases faster. Uh, you could still see steam engines. You can go to the National Transportation Museum, for example, in St. Louis and see steam engines. Some of them still operate. I don't know if you were able to see the big boy that came through, uh, I guess, a year or two ago. A massive steam engine, very impressive uh, thing to see. Uh, but you really can't see a 19th century steamboat being operated. Uh, they didn't really survive the, being the way they were built. You can go to the Arabian and see what's left of them, or the Bertrand and see you know, pieces of them. Uh, you can see boats, boats that look like the steamboats, but probably aren't exactly operated the same. And uh, they're primarily for excursions. I think they use probably diesel engines rather than uh, you know, wood or coal. Uh, not environmentally friendly and probably not all that safe either. Um, but you don't see them operate. Nonetheless, uh, Nathan Philbrick said that the steamboat was like a Bowie knife or barbed wire or the Colt Revolver or the Winchester Rifle. It was one of the innovations that helped settle the West. And I think that's true.